Yes, thank you so much, uh, Janice. Those are very kind words, and I deeply appreciate them. Uh, now, I hope I'm audible to everyone. I'm highly wired up here. I have a microphone, I have video. I feel like one of these people sent out in spy movies. But uh, if you can't hear me clearly, then all is for naught, so please alert me. Uh, I wanted to start by uh, thanking people, but there's so many people that it would be invidious to name any particular names. So let me thank generically, certainly the university. I'm very grateful to Weston, first for uh, making me the subject of a senior hire, and then for all the opportunities and the, the wonderful colleagues uh, that I've <coughs> met with here. Uh, particularly to my own faculty, to my immediate colleagues in the uh, faculty and the English department, uh, but much more broadly in the university as well. And then I should also thank my research colleagues uh, here in Canada, right here in London, uh, here in Canada more broadly, and then in other countries, obviously, particularly in my case, Iceland, Scandinavia, mainland Scandinavia, uh, and, but many other countries elsewhere as well. It's truly an international field. Uh, I should thank Shirk and other funding agencies, the Nordic Council would be another one, for a great deal of help on the fiscal front. I certainly thank my own teachers, uh, one of whom wrote one of the references for me, a, a truly loyal supervisor. And I also thank my students, and I mean that too, I'm not just saying that formulaically. My students are very good at prodding me and making me think of things. Uh, and then of course I thank my wife, my uh, immediate family and my friends. So <coughs> now to talk about the, the, the Buddhas and the Butternuts. Uh, like many of my colleagues, I think, uh, in this faculty and uh, also widely elsewhere, I'm inter interested in the process of contact, cultural transfer between human communities. And I think it's a truly exciting time to be a researcher in those fields where there's uh, excellent studies uh, like those by Jared Diamond and Barry Cunliffe about diffusion and cultural transfer over the long durée, uh, in some cases uh, spans of tens of thousands of years, which forces uh, or give us the encouragement to think in terms of very large patterns indeed, spanning thousands of kilometres or as I say thousands of years. And I've, although I was interested in the Vikings from long before, probably from childhood actually, it's uh, one of these things that takes a grip on you and is hard to lose, and that kind of work has assumed new pertinence in light of these studies of cultural transfer and history over the Lantiochre, because the Vikings are such a splendid, almost limit case of that, certainly an extreme case of it, because their contacts were so far flung they, they were so numerous, they were so far-reaching. So <coughs> I want to dramatise this for you, as it were, uh, by giving you a kind of a sketch of a case study where I talk about two extreme examples of what I think are cultural transfer, but at the same time I'll endeavour to problematise for you what assumptions underlie that so that you can see my working and judge for yourself whether you think I'm honest in seeing examples of cultural transfer here I'll take one of those from the far west, and that's the butternuts, and I'll take one from the far east. This is from the point of view of Vikings, uh, far, rather than necessarily from our own geographic point of view, uh, the far east, and that's the Buddhas. And I'll preface those two parts with uh, a, a brief account of Viking outreach in general. So if we start with, uh, is that going to work? Yes. So I think we should need to start with the Viking livelihood because that's been the subject of a great deal of uh, reductive analysis and we need lots of corrections there. It's still quite uh, popular whenever there's a conference about the Vikings and particularly in the British Isles for the media coverage to say immediately, were they settlers or were they raiders? And this is such a wonderful example of a false dichotomy that it ought to be in all the textbooks. So I'll try to do a quick revisionist study of that. That's uh, the Viking in popular culture. I, I have friends and colleagues who spend a lot of time analysing just that. Uh, the main reason that I want to bring it to your attention is the outreach. If I could get the... Uh, yes, well, anyway, you can see that... Uh, I think the laser might not quite be working. But you can see he's in pursuit of a butterfly. 
and that's probably slightly implausible, but anyway. <laughs> uh, to how the Vikings might have seen themselves, that's probably as, as good as we'll ever know. It's from a picture stone or built stand uh, from the island of Gotland, Swedish uh, county in the Baltic Sea. Uh, it's a funeral, funerary monument. And you see that the Vikings were technologically proud. They were proud of their sails, they were proud of their rigging. And it's a source of argument among scholars as to whether that's been overdone in the depiction uh, to this day. Uh, you can see a set of Viking warriors there. It's probably just one profile, as it were, and there'll be other people on board as well. I thought I... <coughs> it's tougher to find stones with depictions of Viking women, except for a special case that I'll uh, deal with separately. But here's, I think, a very good depiction from a belt buckle, uh, ninth, ninth century. And you can see that she's quite a strong woman. So, if you, were, if you belonged to the CRA and you were trying to compute the Viking lifestyle and fit it into one of those forms that we all fill out uh, at the magic fiscal time of the year, you would need a lot of room under other income. And I'll just give you an illustration of that. Um, but first, uh, just to talk about who they were, the, they're, they're not an ethnicity, that's, uh, that's something else that's sort of quite a popular misconception. They're more like a kind of livelihood which uh, can be joined in on by different self-selecting groups. And the ones that we think of as classic Vikings are these mainland Scandinavian peoples, uh, who were speakers of the Proto-Norse language, so classic uh, Norwegian, Swedish, Danish, uh, etc. Except those names are kind of anachronistic for the period I'm talking about because uh, often it would be more at the level of petty kingdoms and smaller communities within what we nowadays call Denmark, Norway, Sweden, etc. And then the thing that uh, in stereotypes tends to be forgotten entirely uh, there's no sort of ethnic bias about this. You can perfectly well find sources that mention Slavic members of these Viking groups, uh, Baltic members, Sami, the indigenous people, and also even Saxons and Frisians. They're all perfectly capable of joining in. And this is a tradition that goes right back to Germanic contacts with the Romans. Right, so now to talk about the livelihood proper. And uh, I'm going to start with raiding because that's what you first think of. And then extending from that, they did quite a lot of mercenary warfare where they'd be being used by someone like the Byzantine emperor or sometimes it might be the Holy Roman Emperor in the West. They were extremely useful as uh, mercenary forces. And sometimes, as with the Varangian Guard, they approximated loosely approximated to the Swiss Guard for the Pope uh, nowadays. Uh, another thing that they were good at was forming alliances, uh, influence broking, and even being invited to serve as a royal dynasty, as happened in Russia. Russia would not be called Russia if it weren't that a whole lot of Swedes uh, called Rus, Rutsi, were invited to the area that's now Ukraine to provide a royal dynasty because the local communities felt they needed one of those and where to go better than to somewhere where Vikings were at home. Uh, then a couple of other things that I've put together because they're very difficult to differentiate in practice and I'll come back to this theme. Uh, gift exchange, <coughs> trading, both those things go on and farming. This is where you get to the settler end of the dichotomy. As I say, there's an awful lot in between. And it's not all fishing. If you've got an estate, chances are it's in the arable, comparatively flat areas near the coast, and you take your boat out and you fish. You see herrings, you go for them. Uh, and the same for cod. And crafts. These people particularly were good at smithing. 
that they would have people with them who were fully capable of finding bog ore in a stream, in other words, iron ore nodules, and smelting them and turning them into useful nails and rivets for their ships. And then finally, maybe this is counterintuitive, but I built a good part of my career on it, so I at least hope it's true. Uh, a, lot of <laughs> uh, a lot of energy was spent by certain Vikings who were active warriors, farmers, uh, riveters, etc., uh, also on composing poetry and oral narrative. And though that doesn't sound like much of a livelihood or a mixed income, they had a lively sense of IP, intellectual property, and particularly Iceland became a resource for it that was uh, uh, well known in uh, mainland Scandinavia and also elsewhere uh, in Germany, for instance. So that's their livelihood. Now I want to talk about some of the things, a tiny subset of the things that they, the commodities that they dealt with. And this is where we need to problematize uh, any idea of what these objects were for. Because in front of you there you have cowrie shells. And I'm sure you know that uh, in certain areas, in, in Africa for instance, uh, in South Asia, cowrie shells have had a long history of being used as currency. Not least because the little notches in the shell that you can see there uh, can serve as sort of tally sticks. So they're a natural form of currency and they're nice looking too. Now the Vikings uh, certainly had some of these. They've been found in Viking occupation layers in England, uh, in Lincoln, for instance. So these carry shells certainly got around and it's thought that they started in Sri Lanka. Uh, the Vikings themselves, of course, did not get to Sri Lanka. This would have been a mediated process and probably uh, the, the most important mediators were Arab traders. So let us move on in, in that direction. Silk, here's something where it's very hard to know. Is it a prestige commodity? Is it a gift? Was it traded? We can't quite say. But that's from Istanbul and it winds up in the Viking Age occupation layer in mainland Scandinavia. Here, uh, Arabic coins, dirhams, uh, a word that's related to denarius, the Latin for penny. But were they used as money by Vikings? It seems not. The Arab traders, uh, the uh, Islamic traders certainly used it as such. But when the Vikings got their hand on it, on it, it became bullion, and sometimes it could even be modified and rehammered or even melted down to an extent and used as personal accessorizing. So you would find uh, fine ladies and gentlemen of that time with dirhams in their necklaces or other kinds of accoutrements. Uh, stepping slightly forward in the chronology now, resurrection, uh, yes, resurrection eggs, that's the equivalent, if you like, of a Fabergé egg, Viking style, made in Ukraine and brought by trade or theft or gift, who, who shall say, but brought anyway to, uh, to Sweden, uh, Sigtuna, a great uh, royal and centre and trading town. Then moving on somewhat to Western Europe, the Carolingian West, we find all kinds of uh, jewellery and uh, particularly arm rings in deposits uh, left by the Vikings. Often these seem to be hoards and they're hoards associated sometimes at least with temples as the temples are timber and tend to rot in the ground, often your best indication that there was a temple there is all these rings and other bling. They must have had some sacral significance. And then uh, moving on now to the British Isles. The British Isles were very rich in silver and the Vikings found silver very handy too. That too they used as bullion they didn't respect necessarily whatever the silver had been made into, a magnificent arm ring or whatever it might be. They cheerfully hacked it up, literally, or they melted it down and uh, used it for their own purposes. And sometimes these would be to provide uh, rings and other accessorising, but sometimes it was for other useful purposes, dowries, mor morning gifts, the money to buy lumber from Norway to build a house in Iceland. That they could be used for all sorts of purposes. 
And a lot of this hack silver seems to have got buried and forgotten at times of turmoil or maybe in sacrifice to, uh, in, to ancestral gods. Moving now to uh, something made of a local raw material or a North Atlantic raw material, here are these magnificent and very famous chess pieces, the bulk of which are in the British Museum. Uh, they're so expressive, they're so individuated, they're such a work of art. Uh, and it's now known pretty much beyond doubt that they were made in Trondheim, uh, 12th century Norway, and used, no doubt, by some magnate or chieftain in the Isle of Lewis, which is where they were discovered. So made of walrus ivory, but there's a lot more walrus ivory that's disguised. Uh, a Danish archaeologist has done a lot of uh, stable isotope analysis or had a lab do it for her, and she has discovered that the bulk of what's billed as ivory in European museums and in cathedral tre treasuries and such in the Middle Ages up to the 14th century is walrus ivory, not elephant ivory, and that makes no difference what it says on the placard. It's, it's walrus ivory. Finally, I wanted to mention one rather sort of uh, bulky and awkward thing to trade in. These fellows, they might, uh, we know for sure that they were hunted in Greenland as gifts for popes, emperors, kings. If you were to excavate now in the right place in the Tower of London, you'd undoubtedly find some polar bear skeleton because it's beyond doubt that it's on record that there were trophy zoos that certain English kings had. And the same would apply to the Vatican. There must be polar bear bones down there, probably from Greenland, but might be across the strait from what's now Quebec, the Angava Peninsula. So that brings the story back home to an extent. Now I want to talk about the first of my extremes, the, the Buddhas. And uh, as you see there, we've got uh, a little Buddha statuette of a type made in Kashmir. Uh, it's very, uh, the, the, the scholarship on all this is uh, sort of beyond doubt because almost a matching Buddha still exists uh, in Kashmir where it would have been made, uh, quite astonishing. Very small, about eight centimeters high. Uh, could have been used as an amulet of some kind. There seem to be the traces of such a thing having been attached to the, to the owner as, as some kind of good luck thing, a charm, a sacral item, hard to say which. Uh, the Buddha's posture combines the ideas of fear not and uh, I have achieved enlightenment, the hand down to the earth, suggests the, the latter thing. How much the Vikings knew of that is very much an open question. Probably not, but possibly yes. The thing that gets intriguing when you start pondering that is the association in which this Buddha was found in uh, Helje, uh, an island in uh, Lake Mälaren in Sweden. Uh, he was found, or it was found, with the top of a crozier from Ireland, in other words, another ritual or liturgical item, and a Coptic christening scoop. So you've got this little cluster here. Was an appreciation that all three of these things were sacral, or was this just stuff that uh, kind of looked souvenirable? On, on, for someone. The reason why I chance my arm here and talk about a cultural transfer at some level is that the design aspect of the Buddha does seem very clearly to have been imitated. This fellow here is part of a bucket or pail from a Norwegian royal burial, burial and from dendrochronology we can date that exactly. It's 834 Christian or common era. Uh, it comes from a magnificent ship, which you can nowadays see in the Victor uh, Viking Ship Museum in Oslo. Uh, nearby is the Fram, for anyone who's interested in polar exploration of the previous century. And so it's quite the treat to go out there. And uh, you'll certainly want to spend lots of time with the Ozebear ship. And as part of doing that, you'll see this bucket with its really quite small figure that looks like a Buddha. Uh, Scholars have uh, thought of, in fact, when the excavation was first done by those uh, gentlemen just over a hundred years ago, the comparison was immediately made. It was immediately dawned on people. But there have been two schools of thought about how to interpret it because there are, 
here, the, the laser point there is very faint, but maybe you can see it. There are native Irish and Northern English figurines or statuettes that have that same cloisonne uh, enamel ornamentation, the, the, the tunic the, that you see on the right hand figure. And that my Buddha, whom I've put in the middle there, clearly has that too. So there's clearly some Irish or Northern English element to his manufacture. On the other hand, He's got those uh, crossed legs as if on the lotus, like the Buddha there, uh, and whereas the, the figure that's undoubtedly Irish or Northern English does not. So what I'm suggesting here is that there's a fusion, at least at the level of uh, design ideas. Uh, so one could go further. This would be speculation, but it's sort of interesting speculation. A thing about the Vikings is that, and here's another stereotype, they didn't just worship Odin, Thor, Freyr, and a number of other gods that you'll find uh, mentioned sort of uh, on websites and so on. They, they were astonishingly eclectic in the different gods and the systems of belief that they adhered to, or partly adhered to, because they seemed to have cherry-picked. They uh, had a great belief in systems of belief, just so you could cherry-pick the bits you wanted. And this is uh, like a traditional sort of Viking burial, as best we can gauge, what they call a ship setting, skip satining. Um, but here's something from another Gotland picture stone that's got a distinct Near Eastern look to it. Look at the costumes of those people, fellow being ushered into the other world, it would seem, uh, or the afterworld, but look at their costumes. They don't look like Viking costumes. And probably still more to the point, Here's a funerary ship, a ship taking people to the afterworld, but it's not like that ship with its intricate rigging that I showed you before. It's like a boat you could still see on the Nile nowadays with the cuddy or sort of sun shield uh, in the middle there. It does not look like a Viking ship. Somebody in Gotland has been down to the Near East, to the Levant, and they've, if they've souvenired, it's more than just souvenirring uh, a stencil. I think there's somewhere here that comes more into souvenirring a part of somebody else's system of belief. Right, now I want to bring us to the butternuts and a rather different uh, item for cultural transfer. So let's have a picture of one first. They're getting scarce. The butternut trees have a lethal canker. They will soon apparently be extinct in North America. So if you haven't seen one ever, go out and see one. It's a case of uh, now you see them, now you don't. Uh, let, let me preface talking about the butternuts proper by saying that since 1960, it's been a matter of fact rather than speculation that Norse voyages, and it's the word Viking in this context probably is a little bit dangerous, so I prefer to call them Norse voyages. We know they came from Norway in part, Iceland in part, and uh, Greenland in part and that they had, to some extent, Irish cultural trays and, uh, uh, and yes, items about them, cultural items, in addition to what they brought from the three Scandinavian countries. And they formed uh, what seems to have been a, a gateway kind of settlement, not a long, long-term settlement, but a settlement good for about 10 years at a place called Lancy Meadows in Newfoundland. Uh, very strategic. You can see it looks, it looks across the Strait of Belle Isle towards Labrador. It wouldn't be sheltered, it would be anything but sheltered, but you certainly could see if shipping was coming uh, westwards, having rounded the Labrador coast from further north, ultimately coming from Greenland or Baffinland. So a nice little posse. And there's, there's a map of the Gulf of St Lawrence just to show you. And, uh, yeah. Yeah, the laser's a bit uh, fitful there, but if you look to the very top of the great northern peninsula of Newfoundland, you're pretty much on the spot where Lancy Meadows is. So this, um, you could call it a, a camp. That was traditionally what it was called, actually, by the locals at Lancy Meadows. They, they thought it was an Indian camp, because there are many such. But uh, as I say, archaeology established clearly that it had not been occupied by indigenous peoples within the relevant time period and there were quite conclusive items, cultural items, pertaining 
to, uh, to Scandinavian and Irish descended people uh, in the occupation layers. This, uh, this is the remains of their accommodation. You have to imagine halls on top of that, and there we are. There's, uh, there's one that magically appears. It's, been, uh, it's the subject of reconstruction, and it's thought very authentic reconstruction as well. Uh, I didn't think personally, having negotiated my way around it, that it was that commodious. But if you look at the, the work of economic anthropologists, then to build something like this would take the resources that only magnates or earls or kings could command. To build a, a winter, overwintering camp like this to accommodate 60 to 90 people would be the big enterprise at the time. And this is why it's now thought that it has to have been a gateway settlement and people would not really, these uh, Norse voyages in coming would not probably have had further settlements deeper into the Gulf of St. Lawrence. They would have used this one and then no doubt just slung up tents and awnings as we know they did. Uh, so the, the chances are that we'll never, never will find further archaeological remains in Canada or the States. This is, this is it, so we should enjoy it. Uh, and furthermore, we can go out there and enjoy it. In the occupation layer, we found two butternuts, one represented there, pen to give you the scale, and a butternut barrel. And the, the butternut barrel is uh, terribly interesting because we know that such barrels were sent home to Norway to be fashioned into drinking bowls, bigger than this one. This one's got metal blade marks on it and clearly was a trial piece for someone to get a sense of the uh, qualities of the wood. Butternut wood is actually rather soft, so it would need a gentle touch with whatever steel you were using. Uh, there's a picture of butternut tree. I actually found that outside a bed and breakfast in Edmonton for myself. And uh, having failed to find one in the, uh, the well-known uh, Fredericton Arboretum, which is in itself a sad story, I think. Now, let me tell you some stuff about butternuts, if I can just get the ears. So a very useful tree. I can't even go into all its uses, but it has these flavoursome edible nuts. Lots and lots of oil, as much oil as walnuts, so you can crush them. And, and, or as the indigenous peoples did, boil them up and skim off all the oil. They're so heavy they won't float. Their, their northern limit is the southeast of Canada, uh, and they're probably mostly at home, much further south in, the, in Kentucky and locations uh, of that sort. Along, along the St. Lawrence River, they don't grow further east of a line that you could draw up from the start of the Gaspé Peninsula to Tadoussac. They don't, you don't find them beyond that. And as best we know from, den, uh, from, uh, panelog <laughs> from pollen analyses, let me say, <laughs> Uh, and, and also from traditional knowledge, they weren't there at an earlier stage. The, a critical thing to register when we're talking about Viking trade or acquisition of these things is that they were not in New Brunswick, according to traditional knowledge and palynology, until about 600 years before present, which of course is a long time after the Vikings were there because we're looking at a Viking occupation of the turn of the previous millennium, about a thousand uh, common era. Now, I said before these, uh, these uh, nuts would not float. They tended to be deliberately propagated by indigenous peoples, as also, of course, uh, by squirrels. And they, they were planted close to villages. Uh, early travelers, European travelers, report seeing whole orchards and stands of nut trees, for instance, around the Niagara Peninsula. Uh, that was the, the case. And the big reason for that is that you can't just go some great distance in the hope that butternuts will be all nice and ready for you because as soon as they ripen, they go rancid. So you've got to get them at the crucial moment. You want them right by where you're living. So that leads to a hypothesis that I want to float in your direction, which is that the Although there's this great idea of these Vikings or Norse, uh, Norse voyagers being so self-reliant and finding everything for themselves, and I've read accounts that said they went and found and picked the butternuts, etc., uh, that's, that's not very feasible. One, the butternuts weren't anywhere near the Gulf of St. Lawrence. They were way up the St. Lawrence River, uh, actually somewhat uh, west of Quebec City. And 
they, uh, and they had to be picked at just the right time. So I would say fairly clearly, as a working hypothesis, we're talking here about trade with relevant peoples, the Iroquoian peoples, and perhaps um, with them mediating, uh, and ultimately Algonquian peoples. Uh, and so it's, it's, it's not a case of Viking self-reliance, that's a rather false piece of ideology, very powerful, but false, but rather a trading and transfer process. Why do I say, why do I say cultural transfer? Rather amazingly, and very luckily, we have uh, a skaldic stanza preserved in a 11th century Norwegian context that praises what are clearly very expensive and exotic nuts that are good enough for a king to give to two of his leading poets. And these poets were not small cheeses, they were big cheeses in, in the court. They, they deserved their share of honours too, and they would be decidedly spiteful if they didn't get their honours. So these, these nuts have to be something special. They don't, I think, they can't be walnuts. Walnuts are much too commonplace. But something rather special, like the burls that were used in Norway, these uh, butternut burls, so actual butternuts in Norway. So that's just to show you the, the manuscript that the, this poem comes from, to prove that I'm all on the level, and the, the poem is really there and something that looks like uh, an 11th century hand. So just drawing, uh, and I'm sorry, I'm probably a bit over time, uh, just drawing sort of a conclusion from this, uh, I've invoked two literally extreme examples uh, belonging to a livelihood defined group that itself is extreme in nature. But what I hope to have illustrated out of that is a, a much more general idea that, uh, that qualitative and to some extent quantitative dimensions of contact and diffusion go far, far back before modern technology. And uh, in principle, they've contributed to the history of all of us. So thank you very much.